Okay. Good morning, everyone. We're here for the fourth and last installment on African American art with Gail Sharon, who's a docent at the St. Louis Art Museum. Gail, uh, as you know, has been a longtime friend of the Merwood Center, and she has been helping us uh, and partnering with us for several years now since the pandemic began. And we are uh, going to miss her in the next few months. She's going to take a break, but hopefully she'll be back in January, early 2023. And we are so, so appreciative of her expertise and her kindness and her friendship. So thank you, Dale. And um, I think we're ready to begin. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, it's been fun and I'm, um, I'll miss you all, but we'll see you again um, in, 2023. So in the meantime, um, I hope you're all enjoying this summer weather in St. Louis. We never know what it's going to be like. Um, but today, I think we better get going because we have a lot to look at. And we're going to resume our series on African American art and kind of pick up where we left off last month um, with a continued look at African American artists in our permanent collection. SLAM um, has some fan favorites, um, pieces that you're going to love or that you have loved over the years. And then we're also going to be looking at um, some of the pieces from the Ali collection. Um, at the end of, of the tour, um, I also want to look at the influence of African art on contemporary Western art. Um, I've always wanted to kind of talk about this topic, um, but it, it's never been kind of the right time. And this one seems like it probably is. So with that in mind, um, you've already seen some incredible pieces from our collection, but hold on to your hat because we have um, some pieces that I know are going to blow you away. So let's begin with some works from the Ali collection. Um, this is another landmark moment for the St. Louis Art Museum. The Ali collection added 39 works of art, African American art to our collection, and it was given to SLAM by Monique Inran Ali in 2017. Only three of these artists were represented in our collection before the gift, Sam Gilliam, Jacob Lawrence, and Norman Lewis. We saw two of them in some of the past presentations. Along with several more works by these well-known artists, the Ali gift includes others that make our African collection world-class. So the collection features 60 years of abstract art by black artists in America, five generations of artists from the depression to World War II to civil rights and pop culture, and finally to abstraction. The endurance of abstraction within the black community was a commitment and statement and not accepted by the black community at large. Most African-Americans wanted social commentary. So this collection not only features incredible artists, but artists that bucked the prevailing artistic philosophy of black activism. So abstract art became popular with African-American artists in the 1960s. And abstract art with its rejection of representation often resists simple analysis or explanation. And it's very kind of, I guess we could call it open-endedness is no doubt part of its having lasting appeal. Artists discovered that abstraction creates an emotional response from the viewer. It's storytelling, but in a different way. It's not narrative, not realistic in the sense of a portrait, it's suggestive. And these artists use the studio as a laboratory to see what different materials could create. Most were not concerned with a message, but about the creative use of line, texture, color, shape, and form. By looking at an abstract work, it's difficult to guess that the artist is black. No single approach or motive dominates among these artists. For many abstract artists like Frank Bowling, Norman Lewis, and Sam Gilliam, critical and commercial success provided evidence that Black artists were capable of, of overcoming racial obstacles 
in taking their rightfully earned places within the contemporary art scene. They're finally gaining the recognition they deserve. The oldest artist in the collection is Norman Lewis and the youngest is Nanette Carter. Ali went on to their studios where he, where he watched them demonstrate their techniques and he became friends with many of them. And he also donated a lot of archival material to SLAM. So let's look at some of these incredible abstract artists that we're happy to say are now part of SLAM's permanent collection and that we can see often. So let's look first at Sam Gilliam. He was born in Mississippi in 1933 and moved to DC in 62 and became affiliated with a group of abstract color field painters. A series of formal breakthroughs would eventually result in his now iconic, what he called drape paintings, which expanded upon abstract expressionism in an entirely new way. Gilliam's drape paintings, which were particularly inspired by observing women hanging laundry on clotheslines, freed the canvas from the stretcher. Sam Gilliam achieved notoriety in the mid 60s for works of this type, in which backing materials traditionally used to support the canvas were removed to create this sort of hanging sculpture thing. Testing the limits of how art could be presented, he arranged his paintings in space, collapsing their surfaces onto overlapping shapes. In half circle red, Sam Gilliam soaked and poured paint onto the canvas, which he crumpled and tied until it dried, creating a bold and vibrant surface. Later, he unfurled the canvas and cut it into shapes that he combined to hang directly on the wall, again, without a frame or a structure. Consequently, these, these paintings drape, gap, bulge, double over, draping his canvases on the wall where they bunched and billowed like tapestries. Complex color and texture evident in golden neck, which is assembled from fragments of paper, thickly coated with acrylic, and then they're stitched together, they're sewn together. And you can actually see the stitches when you get up close, you can't see it in the slide. As with his shaped paintings, Gilliam prints like this one often deviate from the traditional rectangle format and have a sculptural quality. The resulting work blurs the line between the painted image and a three-dimensional object. Now, Gilliam was the first African-American artist to represent the United States at the Venice Biennale in 1972, which he considers one of his proudest achievement. At auction, a number of his pieces have sold for seven figures. Stan Whitney came of age during the Vietnam War. He was not interested in activism only art. He traveled around the world and that was his impetus. Whitney was interested in a single unit of architecture, the block. Visiting Rome in 1992, he admired the blocks used to construct ancient structures. And in Egypt in 1966, he marveled at the density of the pyramids. Squares of color from a loose grid an organizing structure was the organizing structure for all of Stanley Whitney's work. He distilled colors into blocks or grids that are vibrantly colored. And he revisits the grid over and over and over again. There is no repetition of image. It's kind of a bird's eye view where you're looking down with formal elements, logical and rational, but then covered with drips and smatters of paint. So his grids do not have that kind of precision that you would have seen in a Mondrian um, painting. Color is as important to Whitney as shape and is the primary subject matter. Here, one might be looking down on a landscape or shipping containers as seen from above, or it might be some kind of an architectural construct. Frank Wimberly um, is, is gonna be the third we'll look at. This seemingly simple work actually contains many layers of paint and fabric. Scratches reveal a ground of bright orange or pinky color in the background. The white rectangles in the center is built up from layers on the canvas and its sides shimmer with iridescence, pinks and gold. 
Frank Wimberly's approach to assembling these elements was inspired by jazz. In turn, it was appreciated by musicians like Miles Davis, who collected his work. He composed with layers of texture and depth and luminosity. He even used sawdust to give you texture. I really love the design of this piece. Somehow it speaks to me. Um, brightly colored triangles transform into vertical stripes moving from left to right. James Little's variation of color shape in, and interval width within kind of a repeating pattern create a dynamic com composition. Now Little uses historic painting materials to create works like this. According to the artist, he said, I'm not interested in illusionism. I'm interested in flatness and materials that keep illusions at bay. He painted with a mixture of heated wax, beeswax and raw pigments, developing a, a version of, of what we call encaustic painting, which was a technique used first by ancient Egyptians and Greeks. The wax is translucent and it gives the work kind of an inner glow. He made his own paint and was influenced by African textiles, except that his works are softer and more pastel. They're precise and Little probably didn't use tape, he said, but scored the paper to get even lines and stop the paint from oozing. Since he didn't let anyone into his studio to watch him paint, um, we'll never really know what his technique is, but I still like it. Slightly off keel, number 60, is a title referring to a sailboat's delicate balance as it speeds through the water. It consists of multiple um, mark-making types, both structured and loose. Moving away from canvas in the late 1990s, Nanette Carter adopted mylar, um, a translucent polyester film, as her support of choice which she admired for its potential to be used on both sides. The material is frosted on the surface and can easily hold oil paint, which she applies by brush and sometimes printing. She made this in 1999, and it was kind of about social condi conditions. Is Y2K going to explode? Is the world all off keel? That was her question. Herbert Gentry created dreamlike fantasy worlds populated by totems and mask-like faces emerging from a tangle of brightly colored lines. A devoted abstractionist, Gently Gentry, studied with the French Cubist painting George Brock and Dubuffet. Gentry retained the figure as a means to see form. Above all, Gentry insisted his image be allowed to unfold freely without plan, relying on a certain spontaneity where the subconscious plays a large part in his role. His work has a childlike spirit. He ran a jazz club in Paris and sketched the people there. Uh, the jazz club is called Shea Honey. <laughs> he galvanized people around him and he was the one who really helped Ali collect. He kind of pointed him in the right direction. The fragment, this fragmented collage comprises a self-portrait. The carefully arranged small squares create a paper version of Jack Whitten's unique approach to painting. Here he collected small tiles of dried acrylic paint. And he paid homage to black individuals who contributed to society in a whole series, um, such as Maya Angelou and Muhammad Ali. But with this collage, Witten places himself among these groundbreaking luminaries. Uh, while Witten's primary focus here was investigating artistic materials, his title also grounds his image in the tradition of portraiture. He had in mind a specific phrase, the image is photographic. Therefore, I must photograph my thoughts. By the end of his career, Rutten has started exploring digital technology, creating works such as Apps for Obama, which might be considered a version 
of black of Barack Obama's iPad. As with many painters whose style matured in the 60s and 70s, Witten's career wasn't widely recognized until the past few years. But today when Witten's today when Witten's visually seductive paintings appear in major museum shows, it's become difficult to imagine a history of abstract painting without his work. Ed Clark produced bands of interfused colors such as those evident in this work. And he pushed the pigments across the surface with a single stroke. This maneuver also executed horizontally on the floor offers Clark the implied motion he wanted in his images, kind of a directional force rather than just an overall painting. Often he used a janitor's broom something bigger than a brush to get these images. He found that discrimination made it difficult to get into circles to get ex exhibitions. So Clark went to Europe where race wasn't as important. And he said that no matter what I do, there's not a day in my life where I'm not an artist. And lastly, in the Ali collection, layered spirals, a signature motif for Al Loving create a dynamic vertical composition which seems to sprout new forms that it ascends the wall, some kind of creature. Since the early, his early career, the artist created sprawling configurations of repeated shapes large enough to take over walls. Loving along with contemporaries such as Sam Gilliam, who we just saw, was interested in producing art that rejected traditional supports. So there are no stretchers or frames. For this work, he constructed a plexiglass backing, which gives the collage a free, free floating sculptural presence. Um, he, he, it's supposed to represent um, Mercer Street in Manhattan. The edges of the sheet are irregular and symbolize the imperfect box that alludes to the form of a building. In the 80s, Loving started experimenting with the print medium and incorporated handmade and printed papers into collages such as this. I hope this has given you just a hint at the treasures of the Ali collection. I wanted to add another reason the collection was so important for SLAM. It was instantaneous. We acquired the collection all at once. Other museums are adding to their abstract American, to their, I'm sorry, to their African-American collections piecemeal, one at a time, and then takes a long time to find just the right piece. All of that work was done by, Ali, by the Ali's over their many years of collecting. There's a quote by Quincy Thorpe that's at the heart of the Ali collection. He said, abstract art is where the artist leaves his heart inside a language of paint, where the art is shrouded inside mystery and magic, filling up space with wonder. And that I think is the wonder of the Ali collection. So now um, be, before we continue on with influences of African art on modernism, I wanted to end this part of the presentation that features African-American artists with four pieces that are always fan favorites. If they're not now on your list of favorites is slam. I'm sure they will be. This is a, I love this, this one is one of my favorites. This is a still shot of a video that Lewis Cameron produced. It is so cool. Can you guess what it is? I mean, well, obviously the, the title gives it away. I mean, I certainly couldn't. For this video, he scanned an image of a six pack of Heineken beer, which he then distorted on the computer by stretching it into a vertical strip. This, the result is an abstract film that evokes a stream of flowing color. He said, I'm interested in how colors codify within consumer culture. I don't have the burden of making an image that registers in a few seconds like advertisers or people in branding do. I'm interested in that slow read, something similar to a painting experience. It's about consumption and product identity and American identity. He employs color, graphic design, and photo-based images as a means for exploration. He engages in a discourse 
and representation with this mute patient and intimate expectation of an otherwise mundane object. I mean, who doesn't know Heineken Birkin? The piece suggests an underlying elegance in an otherwise cacophony of brands, advertisements, and product. Okay. This is by Nick Cave. Nick Cave was born in Fulton, Missouri in 1959. He creates what he calls sound suits, surreally majestic objects blending fashion and sculpture that originated as metaphorical suits of armor in response to the Rodney King beatings and have evolved into vehicles for empowerment. He said, it was me asking myself, what does it feel like to be discarded, viewed less than, dismissed as a black male? This was his answer. Fully concealing the body, the sound should serve as an alien second skin that obscures race, gender, and class, allowing viewers to look without bias toward the wearer's identity. Cave regularly performs in the sculptures himself, dancing either before the public or for the camera activating their full potential as costume, musical instrument, and living icon. The artist also works with choreographers, dancers, and amateur performers to produce lavish community celebrations in ultra untraditional venues for art. Dazzling in their movement, cave sculptures are crafted from a dizzying array of materials that include beads, raffia, buttons, sequins, twigs, fur, fabric, the sound suits are also displayed in exhibitions as static sculptures, arranged as groups of figures and formations that are striking in their diversity and powerful stance. We had an exhibition in SLAM several years ago um, of perhaps a, a dozen of the sculptures, and they were definitely fan favorites. Cave sculptures also include non-figurative assemblages um, along with these sound suits. He said, I happened to be in the park one day and looked down on the ground and there was a twig. And I proceeded to collect all of these twigs. For some reason, I found myself going back to my studio and building a sculpture. The moment I put it on and started to move, it made a sound. And so that's how sound suit came about. And sound that moment was my call for protest. It was my way of being heard. After that original sound suit, what I found was that I was interested in the whole idea of discarded and really started gathering materials at flea markets and antique malls. And so for me, it's me sort of taking these objects and reintroducing them and giving them a new life. Sound suits are things that we all recognize. You know, how do we look at things that are devalued, discarded and bring a different kind of relevancy to them? Julie Maritu was born in Ethiopia and she lives and works in New York City today. Maritu's points of departure are architecture in the city, particularly the densely populated urban environments of the 21st century. Her canvases overlay different architectural features such as columns, facades, and porticos with graphical charts, building plans, city maps, and architectural renderings from, seen from multiple perspectives. Her paintings present a kind of um, tornado of color, which look like layers of urban graffiti in many ways. Maritu has described her canvases as story maps with no location. They're turbulent and explosive and composed of grids and layers and layers and layers of paint. In gray space, brightly colored dynamic forms float across the canvas, heightening the illusion of vast space. The artists produce such effects as of constant activity and endless expansion by applying multiple layers of pigment alternating between ink and acrylic. They lose their real world specificity and they really cannot be identified. Several years ago, she was commissioned to paint the interior entry to the offices of Goldman Sachs in New York City. So I think we can say that um, 
Julie Meritu is more than an up and coming artist. I think she up and came already. She's arrived. People just love this work. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the museum, it's installed in the entrance of the new building and is shimmering and it's huge. It's a canopy of color. Visitors can't pass this without stopping for a closer look and read the label. It's just that compelling. Ellen Asui is an artist who transforms simple everyday materials into striking large scale installations. He's drawn particular international attention for his bottle top installations like our piece. These installations consist of thousands of aluminum pieces sourced from alcohol recycling stations, flattened and sewn together with copper wire, which are then transformed into sort of a metallic cloth-like sculpture that resembles tapestries. Such materials, while seemingly stiff and sturdy, are actually free and flexible with helps with installation. And sculptures can be shaped in any way and are altered in appearance for each installation. By repurposing metal caps, Ella Natsui and his hundreds of assistants transformed the mundane into something visually mesmerizing. He wanted to draw connections between consumption, waste, and environment. He refers to himself as both a painter and sculptor. He essentially paints and builds up color and pattern with bottle caps. His works have been compared to Ghanaian Kenti cloth, Western mosaics, tapestries and paintings by Gustav Klimp. The work evoke lace, but also chain mail, quilts, but also animal hides, garments, but also mosaics, not to mention the rich ceremonial cloths of numerous sculptures. Their drapes and folds have a sculptural presence, but are also really, I think, just plain captivating. I think the use of bottle caps hints at broader topics such as global consumerism in its history, including slavery. Anasui's materials allude to a devastating legacy. For centuries, European traders exchanged textiles and liquor in West Africa for gold and enslaved people. Fading cloth weaves together a range of political, historical, and visual references. Some have given his works the title, Grace and Gravity. I think it's a fitting description. So as we have seen, the role of Black artists in society is really complex. The artists that we've featured evoke themes influenced by the experiences or times in which they lived. So the themes are both universal and specific. Their work is the sum of the creator's experience, personal, comedy, life events, and histories. And it's from these that the artist's voice emerges. Not all African Americans have the same experience. Most shared some bond of discrimination, but they differed in how they responded. Their work is about cultural and societal forces at work, about humanity and equality and moral obligation and the foundation of our society. Throughout history, the artists tackled these issues, each with different objectives, a different philosophy, and different techniques or style. It's an amazing array of talent and creativity, and I hope you go to the museum to visit them soon. So with that having been said, let's look at um, our next segment, which will be the of a kind of what we might call the evolution of form or African influences in modern art. So I wanna switch gears a bit and talk about how African sculpture in particular served as a catalyst for the innovations of modern artists beginning in Europe and spreading to the United States and to the artists we've just talked about. Seeking alternatives to realistic representation Western artists have admired African sculpture for its abstract approach to the human form. Modern art, like many of the pieces we have just seen, would probably not exist without African art. So let's look at some examples of the influence of African art on Western art aesthetics, what we might call 
the evolution of form. In the early 20th century, African arts, such as these pieces from the St. Louis Art Museum, had a profound influence on the development of European abstract art. Thousands of African art objects have been brought back to Europe in the aftermath of colonial expansion and soon became assimilated into European visual culture. Most of these objects were seen at the beginning as mere trinkets and they lined the shelves of curio shops, flea markets, and even bistro walls. They were treated as artifacts of a strange and exotic and secondary land, and they have little economic value. To historicize this issue a little bit more, let's look at the 18th century where African objects would likely have been housed in a curiosity cabinet where trinkets and novelties were displayed. Now the term cabinet originally described a room rather than a piece of furniture like we say today. Modern terminology would categorize the objects included belonging to natural history, geology, ethnology, archeology span or religious or historical relics. The classic cabinet of curiosities emerged in the 16th century, although more rudimentary collections had existed earlier. These collections were precursors to museums, but the artists, the culture, and the function of these objects was usually not recorded or regarded as significant. Throughout the 19th century, European powers colonized the African continent taking control of tribal lands from original inhabitants and exploiting Africa's natural resources for political and economic gain. As soldiers, missionaries, and administrators rotated through these captured lands, they collected objects that they later took back to Europe. The map shows the area where many of these objects we will be looking at today came from. These African objects were not considered art initially. You have to remember that but rather symbols of Europe's imperial power. By the 1870s, European museums began to exhibit these African artifacts, not as art creations, but rather as ethnographic artifacts of a less civilized people. The art objects were neither appreciative for their aesthetic nor expressive qualities, and the Europeans never really understood the meaning or significance of these works. By the middle of the 19th century, many of these curiosity cabinet collections, including masks such as these from, our, from SLAM, were donated first to the Natural History Museums where they were categorized and classified in the name of science, along with flora and fauna and skeletal remains. However, other more majestic examples were highly revered and found home in art expositions and museums from London to Berlin. So by the early 1900s, these same objects that were initially regarded as artifacts of material culture began to be exhibited in Western art museums and galleries as art. The objects themselves hadn't changed, but there was a shift in the attitudes and the assumption about what constituted a work of art. In the early 1900s, the Parisian press had the public buzzing with exotic tales about the African kingdom, exaggerated stories of savagery and cannibalism sparked a fascination for the land that the French were increasingly occupying. And it was often described as primitivism, a term denoting a perspective on non-Western culture that now is really kind of problematic. But with French colonies expanding throughout Africa, the French learned more about the culture, discovering its beauty and its art. Many African artifacts that were not quite yet referred to as artwork went to Paris museums, such as the Museum of Ethnography du Trocadero. Now, I can't pronounce anything very well, so any French words, so just bear with me. And organizers of the Universal Exposition of 1900, which was a World's Fair in Paris, 
included African statues and masks similar to those in the previous slide from the St. Louis Art Museum. And public reaction was a mix of horror and awe at what they perceived to be gruesome, savage, frightful, and weird objects. But an increasing number of artists, many interested in breaking away from the norms of the art world at the time, began turning to African art for inspiration. By 1905, artists in Paris and Germany began to reflect the influence of African art in their work. These pieces caught the attention of legendary artists such as Henri Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso. They immediately appreciated that while the piece was primitive, it was sophisticated in its abstraction. So it was that African art came to European notice just over a hundred years ago, when artists began to recognize the aesthetic value of African sculpture. At the beginning of the 20th century, Western artists noticed African art instead of dismissing it. So what was it about African masks and African sculpture that inspired these artists? What appealed to the avant-garde? Well, modernist artists were drawn to African sculpture because of its sophisticated approach to the abstraction of the figure shown, for example, in these pieces from Slam. Modern artists embraced African art for its lack of pretension of formal qualities, the exaggerated flatness of the face, the angularity, the simplicity, and well-organized forms that you see in these pieces typify elements of African aesthetics that were frequently evoked in modernist paintings and sculpture. They often appear simplistic, yet distorted, exaggerated and elongated figures and items that were full of repeating geometric patterns. African figurative sculpture usually departs from natural proportions. Realism or physical resemblance is generally not the goal of the African artists. It's a departure from representational accuracy. Contemporary avant-garde artists also saw in African art a phenomenal expressive power. While these artists knew nothing of the original meaning and function of African sculptures they encountered, they instantly recognized the spiritual aspect of the work and adopted these qualities to their own efforts to move beyond the naturalism that had defined Western art since the Renaissance. By these means, the status of visual art was changed. The artists that you see here became avid collectors of African art objects. Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso, for example, had studios packed with African statuettes and textiles. You can see that in their studio. These artists and others like Herkner and, and Giacometti carefully studied these works, mimicked them, and even openly copied their forms. It was in 1905 that on his first trip to the Museum of Ethnography in Paris, that Picasso turned left by mistake, entering the African art galleries and stumbling upon the objects that would lead him to a completely new way of looking at the magical transformative power of art, cubism. Picasso's seminal painting, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon in 1907, a, a portrayal of five nude prostitutes had the aesthetics of traditional African art with distorted figures that had African mask-like features. The piece would ultimately spark the Cubist movement. The fundamental principle of Cubism entails the, represent the representation of different views of things, usually objects or figures, together onto one single picture. This often results in paintings that appear fragmented or abstracted. Chikbizim became one of the most influential painting styles of the 20th centuries and began with Picasso's celebrated painting, The Demoiselle d'Avignon. And you can see the visual sim similarity with the Fang mask on the right. Isn't that just incredible? Picasso truly experienced a revelation as he explored African art further. In our Picasso portrait, you can see African influence in the figure that is, has been rendered with the angular features of African masks. It's also evident in the way the human forms are fractured and distorted. 
and in the use of multiple perspectives on the same image. The woman's face is both frontal and a side view at the same time. So cubism attempted to reveal objects from a different vantage point, from the mind and not only how the eyes perceive them, but how the mind perceives them. Just like the masks that Picasso studied, perhaps one just like this. So led by Picasso and George Brock, the cubist art movement explored geometry and the redefinition of perspective. Brock and the others were influenced by the angularity, the lack of detail, the simplicity and non-traditional perspectives as seen in the mask on the right. George Brock describes African mask as the opening of a new horizon for me. They made it possible for me, he said, to make contact with instinctive things, with an uninhibited feeling that went against the false tradition which I hated, the Renaissance. In this piece, Brock paints several objects that sit on a tablecloth, which is tilted up so the viewer gets both a horizontal and a bird's eye view. Brock's aim was to create a new approach to Western art. African art was used because it helped achieve this goal. Brock didn't use African art as obviously as Picasso. He preferred to paint still lifes and landscapes like the one you see here where Picasso painted figures. French artist Henri Matisse traveled extensively allowing many different cultures to influence his work. In 1906, he went to Algeria and after studying African art became enamored by it. African art began to shape much of his work as he practiced many of the same styles and techniques seen in African masks and fabrics. A small figure from the Vili people, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, was instrumental in the lives of two of the greatest artists of the 20th century. The carved figure in wood with its large upturned face, long torso, disproportionately short legs and tiny feet and hands, was purchased in a curio shop in Paris by Matisse in 1906. The French artist who liked to fill his studio with exotic trinkets and objects of art that would then appear in his paintings paid a pittance for it. Yet when he showed it to Picasso, its impact was profound. This purchase shifted their artistic vision and consequently influenced the School of Paris artists in the early 1900s. Simple and abstract, this monumental composition of three bathers has clear structural and tonal qualities that resemble the aesthetic techniques used in African masks and is said to be Matisse's reaction to Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon the year before. So I, I think it's just amazing. Kuba cloths have been shown in African artworks and in shows in Paris that Matisse may have attended and several remained in his collection at his desk. These handcrafted 19th century fabrics from the Democratic Republic of the Congo were woven from raffia palm fibers and used in dowries. The larger ones served as festive attire at funerals. Matisse's correspondence indicates their inspiration for the paper cutouts that he's famous for. These collages blend Matisse's vivid color palette with the overall patterning of textiles to produce abstract floral forms free floating in space. After hanging panels of the Cuba textiles across the studio walls, Matisse wrote letters to his sister that he often looked at them for long periods, waiting for something to come to him. In old age in the 1940s, as he described, as he descended into ill health, Matisse began to work on his cutouts. He called his cutouts paintings with scissors. Another artist influenced by African art was Italian painter and sculptor Amadeo Mondigliani, who lived in Paris at the same time as Picasso and Matisse. Mondigliani created angular, elongated figures that clearly reflect African influence. He made sketches of the elongated faces of masks and figures, heart-shaped and narrowing to a point at the chin beneath a small mouth, placed unnaturally low on the face. He later adapted this distinctive facial style 
in a series of sculptures and paintings, such as Elvira sitting at a table. Modigliani was living in Paris at the time African art was beginning to influence European painters. Notice Elvira's slit eyes, her long nose, and the tilt of her oval face. This reminds us of African masks. His worth clearly reflects the angular elongations of African art. The long face of this elegant sculpture bears a remarkable likeness to the Fang mask to the right. Modigliani experimented primarily with the abstraction of portraiture, depicting each sitter as though they'd hailed from the same long face, almond eyes, tiny mouth family. Some of the African art's distinctive qualities, blocked out features, geometric shapes and patterns and vitality were also, also caught by other artists such as Jacques Medi. Gazing into the distance with mouth open in wonder, a female figure in hands holding the void leans forward while her long nervous fingers encircle an empty space. Her vulnerable face evokes a sense of psychological alienation. Giacometti joined the surrealist movement in the 1920s, and although the face is thought to reflect images of masks from World War I, they also reflect his interest in African art. The oval shaping of the head, the facial features, and the bending of the lower body all suggest that this artist was influenced by African art, perhaps one like the relic, this reliquary figure from Slam. The elongated angular figure is similar to the African sculptures we saw in his studio photograph. It's very similar. German Expressionism is unthinkable without African art. The beginning of the 20th century saw the beginning of the Expressionist movement originate in Germany. This movement involved the creation of art that expressed emotion and broke from naturalism, from the Renaissance. Artists aimed at evoking emotional ass effects from viewers. And this involved art that often displayed distorted figures and images with little connection to reality. The influence of African art on this movement was great. The German Expressionists also followed the French in defining the norms of the mainstream, defying, I'm sorry, the norms of the mainstream society. Ernst Kirchner was one of the, uh, of such, was one such German artist. I mean, look at its striking woodcut with its brusque lines, angular noses and pointed chin. Artists such as, as Kirchner was, they were all influenced by the raw directness of facial expressions in works of African artists. He used African aesthetics to depict the anxieties of modern life because the artists in Germany between the wars worked extensively with African forms as they rejected naturalism as inadequate to reject their representation of the anxiety, the dislocation, and the discord of interwar German society. Kirchner carved the figure from a piece of oak while her lower body appears in a straight, straight forward position. Her upper torso is forcibly twisted to the side and her left arm is pulled unnaturally behind her back. Her striking mask-like features defined by almond eyes and a bobbed haircut are forcefully assertive. During this period, Kirchner regularly visited the ethnographic museums in Dresden and Berlin, where the forms of African sculpture helped him create a more direct expression of the female nude. Expressionist, expressionist art started in Germany around 1905 at the time when African arts were beginning to gain acceptance. Expressionist artists like Pechstein favored the expression of emotional experience over reality. They were to a vast extent influenced by African arts, especially pertaining to masks and sculptures, even though they didn't fully understand the meaning of the work. The artwork is radically distorted for impact and to evoke moods or ideas. The sharply chiseled mask-like faces in the painting are much influenced by non-Western sculpture. The angst-ridden atmosphere and the intense abstract colors as the green contours around the eyes and the angularity of the figures are reminiscent of the best African sculptures. 
The simplified geometric features and exaggerated expressions reflect the core artistic design of African masks. During the first decade of the 20th century, Africa's artistic influence shook the world of art. Of course, these were not the only modern artists swayed by the power of African masks and aesthetics. Other European artists at the time were also influenced by the way the African sculpture forms reconfigured the human body, including Paul Clay. Paul Clay's manic confusion with its simplistic, almost childlike lines and flattened face is perhaps a good example. Clay was influenced greatly by African tribal art. 1938, he taught at the Bauhaus and focused on creating an intense abstract style, greatly induced by African culture. Now, Paul Clay shows a bird in flight with a tiny head, deep in the red mouth, with wide outstretched, outstretched wings. The artist associated birds and their free movement with detachment from early concerns. He even compared them to angels. Inspired by these drawings of children in African art, he explored the unconscious as a means to access artistic influences. Some scholars suggest affinities between his works and masks of the Bois culture and geometrically patterned fabrics from Mali. A woman in a carnival costume faces the viewer head on, sitting assertively on a table with legs spread wide and wearing a catlike mask. We can't forget Beckman. Beckman depicts this woman as a strong and powerful figure who tosses men aside, suggested symbolically by the image of the jack atop the discarded playing cards in the foreground. Beckman is said to have been influenced by African art as well. Stylistically, the small head and round appendages make the figure appear distorted. Beckman completed this painting after he relocated to the United States. His use of line became even more jagged and geometric in constructing interiors with illusionist and disjointed perspective, a comparison that sometimes likened him to cubism in African art. She's powerful. This woman is powerful, like many African figures he may have been influenced by. To underscore his extreme disillusion with war-torn world that had lost his way, Beckmann employed the classic German expressionist approaches to create a tension for the viewer. But one has to imagine the influence that African figures must have had on an artist whose goal was to create an image that highlighted the discord, the strife, and the dissonance that he saw in the world. The last aspect of modern art movement that was directly influenced by African art was post-war and contemporary African art movement in America. By the early 20th century, African-American modernists had joined other American artists in exploring the formal qualities of African art. By 1925, at the height of the Harlem Renaissance, a black philosopher argued that African-American artists should look to African art as a source of inspiration. Elizabeth Catlett and Houston Chandler, who we previously talked about, looked for inspiration in African arts. These African-American modernists did not just use African artwork as simple visual inspiration, but rather tapped into their original meanings and intent to create works of their own while honoring what moved the original artists in the first place. And you can see the similarities in the forms and figures um, and simple rendering of the, these contemporary pieces. Um, you can also see it in the in Cassie um, power figure. Ceremonial masks and beaded shell work were common in African rituals. Some artists like Zenobia Bailey referenced the elaborate headdresses and hairstyles in her work. Masks such as this one in the middle are worn by men to represent the Igbo ideal of the female beauty. Small balanced features, elaborate hairstyles, and delicate tattoos. 
This mask with its crested sub superstructure and carved openwork forms rising above a, a kind of a hairdo of tight curls, illustrates the elaborate hairstyles worn by girls while emerging from seclusion in preparation for marriage. Elaborate beaded the elaborate beaded helmet mask like the one on the right might also, might also have influenced Zenobia. You can see their similarities there. And lastly, I think African patterning is, is another part of African-American influence in the development of contemporary art. The clashing, almost dizzying designs, fragmented geometric patterns and powerful primitive imaginations attracted many to their designs. Faith Ringgold in her quilt making reacted to these African items covered with bright, bold colors. Surfaces were full of repeating geometric patterns like the Agungun costume on the right. So as we've seen from ceremon ceremonial masks to costumes to religious statues such as these, African artifacts and, sculpture, and sculptures contribute, contributed a powerful influence to the development of the modern art movement during the 20th century. From exotic abstractions to vivid expressions, they ignited a significant artistic departure from what the Western audience was accustomed to and comfortable with. Cubists and other European avant-garde artists who were hungry for viscerally new and dynamic languages of innovation were particularly drawn to the unique elements of representation of African art, launching forward a whole new art movement. Until the 20th century, European artists had pursued the realistic natural representations that they had dominated the art world since the Renaissance. Abstraction was completely new to them. The African sculptors had been practicing it for centuries. In turn, African artists indirectly changed the history of modern art. The significance of non-European art on the avant-garde art of the 20th century modernism cannot be overestimated. It goes far beyond these few prominent artists, though all were particularly instrumental in spreading its impact from cubism to the surrealist, to the expressionist, to the abstractionist, and then to America. Artists had more than just a stylistic affinity for African art. These artists found African abstraction to be the perfect aid to their pursuit of new modes of expression. So I wanna thank you so much for joining us on this journey. As I said before, African-American art is complicated, but I think it's oh so interesting. I hope you, I have piqued your interest and in that you will look for some of these pieces at the St. Louis Art Museum as soon as you can, as soon as you feel comfortable in the galleries. And maybe some of these pieces will become some of your favorites. So until I see you next time, stay well and stay safe. But before that, um, does anybody have any comments or questions? Um, I guess, we, you know, should we unmute, unshare or something? I'm just gonna encourage everyone that, yeah, that you can unmute your devices if you've got any questions or comments. Um, that was the time. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. How did the St. Louis Art Museum get in the position to make such a major comprehensive acquisition from the, the Ali family. Well, the, the Ali family um, donated these pieces to the museum. Um, okay, I, and when I said acquired, I'm sorry. But yeah, they, they had, um, oh, I think about 80 works of art and they gave us 39. Um, some of them went to the Met, some went to other places, um, some stayed in their collection, I'm sure. Um, Ali grew up in St. Louis and um, just had an affinity for the art museum. He went there as a young child. And so uh, he wanted to share his, his work with, um, with St. Louis. Wow, that's, that's a wonderful story. 
I mean, just, yeah. just amazing. He was a lovely man. He, he died, I think, last year. Um, lovely man, really. And, just, and so was his wife. They were a lot of fun. He was funny. He had a, a great sense of humor. Um, I think, to me, one of the most interesting things about all of this um, is the complexity of, of African-American art um, and how the abstract artist was um, in kind of in, you know, in, in a fight in some ways with the artist who was trying to make social commentary. Um, you know, it was, it was a decision these artists had to make. You know, do I talk about my heritage? Is that what I want to do with my work? Or am I really concerned with the, the struggle to make um, abstraction? I think it's an interesting concept and it would have been a different, difficult decision for many of them because for most of these, of the Ali artists, um, they were not accepted by even the African-American community because they were not working on social issues. Um, I also think it's amazing to look at the actual African pieces alongside some of the paintings. Um, were you all surprised at how similar some of them were? Yeah, especially the Picasso. I mean, that, that one, and the um, Mondigliani. I mean, there, it's almost, and when you looked at their studios and you saw the, this array of African art, I was surprised. I didn't think there were, that it was that, um, you know, th that it was that influential. How about you all? Did you feel the same way? I was gonna say you did a great job of connecting dots, Dale. Well, I thought I thought it was really. Um, and when you go to to the museum now, you know, take a look and see if you can, you know, compare if you can see where the influence comes from because it's really strong um, around that time period, the beginning of the the twentieth century. So my son-in-law is from Senegal, and he brought back for me for Christmas a couple of years ago two masks from Senegal, and I had them hanging in my home, and I will never look at them in the same way now. I love, I've always loved them, but now I really have a better understanding of how they helped influence other artists. Yeah, they did. They really did. And I think, you know, now I, I have to say that some of the, the pieces, the, the masks that I showed with Matisse and with Picasso are specific. Um, that's historically, those are the historic masks that they used. The other ones, I kind of thought, well, this looks like it. You know, these, these look like the ones they probably used. Um, you know, there was nothing that was specific about it. We did, you know, it was sort of my um, interpretation, I suppose. Anybody else? I don't know if you're seeing in the chat room, but you're getting lots of wonderful uh, comments in the chat room. So it says, thank you for an amazing series. Looking forward to seeing you again in 2023. Thank you for a wonderful series, fabulous series. And thank you so much for your time and energy in preparing these presentations. Oh, that's really sweet. Well, it's been my pleasure. Um, I hope all of you stay well, and um, I will see you in a few months. Thank you, Dale. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.